After I received my guided sharpening system, one of the first things I discovered was the utter lack of instructional videos. The majority of videos listed as how to or for beginners consist of someone attempting to sell you something. The few which are not poorly made ads are made by guys who have been sharpening for years and do not remember what it is like as a beginner. Although they give excellent advice in many cases, a novice cannot easily follow along. My aim is not only to give you a step-by-step -step introduction, but also explain each step as we go. In this way, you will be able to create your own technique. This video will take you through the process of putting a 17 and a half degree bevel on a knife. As many people want to learn how to put a mirror polish on a knife edge, I will progress through about a dozen stones until we achieve a one micron mirror finish. First, I will lay out everything you will need and give a brief description of why you will need each item. Second, I will place a knife in the clamps and explain how to find the angle. Third, I will progress from an 80 grit stone to a 1 micron stone, which is approximately 22,000 grit. I will strop the knife. And finally, the video will end with obligatory paper slicing. I will be using the hapstone system for this video, but you will be able to follow along with just about any guided sharpening system. The first thing you need to do is set out all of your tools and materials. I do not always use every one of these tools, but for this video I will. You will need a ruler. Clear plastic works best. I find that marking the center of the blade helps with positioning the knife and the clamps. The caliper is needed for reformatting the blade later in the video. A rubber mat is really handy for catching excess water from your stones. I use a pistol mat, but a bar mat will work really well too. I always use a water bowl and a sponge. This is used to clean the stones as you are using them and when you remove the stones from the clamping block. A lot of guys use a drop or two of dish detergent here. I've never tried it. I find it helpful to lay my stones out in the order in which I will be using them. Let's take a look at the stones. I will give a brief description for each as we go. We will begin with the coarse stones. These happen to be my latest purchase. We have an 80 grit, a 150 grit, a 240 grit, and a 400. All of these are made by Venev. I originally purchased these Atoma diamond stones made by Jinday. They lasted six months, sharpening an estimated 70 knives. It's hard to get a baseline on this. I mean, some of them were L Max, some of them were cheap knives, but it's too early to tell how long these Venev will last, but hopefully longer than six months. They do work exceptionally well. Next are the medium grit stones. I recently purchased this Chosera 600. I have three Choceras total, and I'm extremely happy with all of them. I rarely use this 800. It loses quite a bit of material with each use, and I can't say I would recommend you purchasing one. It's also a bit narrower than the average stone, which are 6 by 1 inch, by the way. The 1000 grit is another Chosera, which works really well. This is Jinday's Diamond Resin Stone. 15 micron is approximately 1200 grit. This thing has really held up, and it works very well. I feel confident that I will buy more of these in the future. And the 2000 is yet another Chosera. For the fine grit or high polish stones, I will be starting with this Hindu stand, which is supposedly 3000 grit. It's a bit lackluster in my opinion. I rarely use the thing. And we will finish with two more Jinday diamond resin stones. The 3 micron is equal to 7,000 grit, and the 1 micron is around 22,000 grit. I have natural stones in this range as well, but they rarely get used. These Jinday diamond resin stones are amazing. They really give the bevel a bright and even finish. Certainly worth every penny. 
All right, now that you have your stones set out, it's good to squirt them down with tap water to start. Some guys use oil instead, but keep this in mind. Once you use oil on a stone, there ain't no going back. It will never come off, for better or worse. You will always have to use oil. Some guys soak their stones in a container full of water. Squirting them down has always worked for me. One squirt is good for all of the diamond stones. The Chosera stones need to be squirted semi-frequently as they absorb the water. The magnifying glass allows you to see the scratch patterns each stone leaves in the bevel. I rarely use it now, but it's pretty interesting when you are starting out. Paper towels are a must. It really helps to wipe the blade off before checking for the burr. When using coarse stones, it gets pretty hard to even see the bevel without wiping the blade off. And finally, you need to have a quality angle cube. Don't buy some Harbor Freight piece of crap. The angle cube is just as important as the sharpening stones and the sharpening system. And now it's time to put our knife in the clamps. I spent 13 bucks for this piece of junk, just for you guys. Before Camillus was sold in 08 or 09, the knife maker was a quality brand and had many military contracts. Now it's just foreign made crap floating over here inside a shipping container. Alright, let's open the package and see if it can shave or slice paper. It shaves. It does not slice paper. The package claims this knife has a full tang. Let's check. It looks somewhat better without that garish handle. Before putting a knife in the clamps, I take the roller and mark the center of the blade. Now I line it up with the center of the module. I have recently begun placing a ruler against the base like so, and then lining up the tip and the hilt. This has worked out so far. If you leave the knife even, this will make the bevel wider from the curve to the tip. It is best to only tighten one side first. You may have to do further adjustment. Let's put our 80 grit stone in the clamping block. First, we need to adjust the end stops. Bring the stone to what appears to be all the way back and leave yourself about 3 eighths of an inch extra. Now bring the stone forward and repeat. It is time to zero your quality non-harbor freight angle cube. First set it on the module and zero it out. Set it to the side for a moment. It is important to find a point of reference, not just with the first stone, but with each additional stone as well. Push the stone as far back as possible using light pressure. Now line it up with a reference point. For the video, I'll center it between these two bolts. Now place the angle cube on the stone. This is your bevel angle. Remember to place the angle cube evenly and in the same spot for each additional stone. Do not let it sit like this. All right, we are looking for 17 and a half degrees. There. And we aren't done yet. Now you must turn over the knife and line up the stone again. Is the angle the same? If not, you must adjust the knife in the clamps and try again. If you can get the difference to one tenth of a degree, this is very good. For this system, two tenths is the limit. If the angle doesn't match up on both sides, this causes a major problem. Your bevel will not be even. Specifically, one side of the blade will be wider than the other. Your edge will look horrible and everyone will laugh at you and tell you how much you suck. Later in the video, 
we will use the calipers as a second means to prevent this from occurring. After you gain experience, you will not use the calipers very much. Feel free to buy these at Harbor Freight. It took me several months to realize that I needed to match the angle on each side. I am curious if this is something only Hapstone users need to do, or if all guided sharpening systems require the user to do this. It can be very tedious with certain knives. This one, for example. Each guided sharpening system has a slightly different way of setting the angle. Maybe yours will be more user friendly. While I have this knife out, I should tell you its story. Now you might be thinking, wow, that sucker looks sharp. It is. The astute viewer will be thinking, holy crap, that moron really screwed that knife up. This is a prime example of why you should take care to put your knife in the clamps properly. Every knife is different. A knife shape like this needs to be placed into the clamps like so as I explained before. I first sharpened this knife and defiled it using the Lansky system. I use this particular knife every day at work, and thus I am reminded on a daily basis not to make uneven bevels like this again. Notice how long I've been using it. Mangled or not, it's still a quality knife, guys. Okay, back to our substandard knife. Now that your blade is positioned properly, finish tightening the knife in the clamps. I use the long side of the Allen key to torque these bolts. Now tighten the guitar screws back here. You will notice the knife rise with the clamps a little bit. Finally tighten these grub screws. Only use light pressure with these. Let's make sure we are still at 17.5. It's finally time to give the stone a squirt of water and begin molding this titanium bonded piece of crap into an extremely sharp titanium bonded piece of crap. I couldn't bring myself to look up what the titanium gimmick even means. Maybe it will become apparent as we sharpen. I doubt it. At different times throughout the video, I will count my passes with the stone. I do this to set a baseline. If you have machinations of counting every stroke and repeating the exact amount in a set pattern, just go ahead and forget that. A man cannot sharpen a knife using a predetermined set of cutting and stropping strokes. Many have tried. All have failed. Pushing the stone forward, away from yourself, is a cutting stroke. Back towards yourself is a stropping stroke. That's the bevel on this knife is about 25 or 30 degrees. We need to reformat the blade pretty extensively to reach 17.5. Even so, with this poor quality knife, five passes using cutting and stropping strokes back and forth like using a file should have a considerable effect. If it's as crappy as I think it is, we might even achieve a burr. If this knife were made from S35 or LMAX or some other quality steel, I would still start with five passes before checking the burr. Stopping frequently will allow you to see and feel how the blade edge is shaping. After you gain some experience, this will allow you to work more efficiently by adding additional pressure in some places while letting up in others as you make your passes. A burr has formed at the tip. Just to be clear, the burr is the blade material you have filed from the edge using your stone. We need the burr to be complete from tip to hilt. It is not important that the burr is an even thickness. It can be larger in some places and smaller in others. I use my fingernail to check the burr. Some guys use the pad of their finger. Try both. See what works for you. Okay, I now have a burr covering the entire length of the bevel. Now it's time to flip the knife over and repeat. Clean your stone with the sponge at this point. It helps to always clamp your knife in the same direction. I always start mine with the handle to the right. In this way, 
you can keep track of where you are in the process. This is helpful if you are interrupted, step outside, or are otherwise distracted. Now that we have made a complete burr on both sides, we need to even out our bevel. This is where the caliper comes in. As a beginner, it really helps to use one of these. I'm using a flashlight to make the bevel gleam. Any areas you find where the bevel is thinner will need more work. Continue using cutting and stropping strokes, like a file, until the bevel is even. With most knives, narrow places in the bevel develop at each end of the blade. Less frequently, although still common, the person who finished the knife at the factory will have made uneven spots in the center of the blade. 99.99% .99 of knives are finished with a belt sharpener at the factory. Once the bevel looks uniform on both sides, return the knife to your starting position. Now it is time to start sharpening the blade. At this point, we need to readjust the end stoppers. From here on out, you will be using 99% cutting strokes and 1% stropping strokes. Position the stone so that you can use its entire length. Start at the base and use the cutting stroke like this. Attempt to use the entire length of your stone evenly across the entire blade. Use each stone in the same direction. This is important for the mirror finish. Even though we are taking this bevel down to 1 micron, there will be very small lines visible. Making all of your strokes uniform will give a better finish. That's my opinion anyway. Experiment if you like. Ten passes should be good with this crummy steel. Careful on the tip. Do not run past it or let the stone lean over. Now take your finger and feel for the burr. 80 grit is so coarse, you will not have trouble finding it, trust me. If there is a spot, or multiple spots, where the burr is not formed, take a mental note of where they are on the blade. If you find a spot without the burr, do 10 more passes. When you do this for the first time, you will probably have the urge to apply a lot of pressure. But there is no need for this. Fight the urge. Now flip the knife and do 10 passes on this side. Check the burr. Repeat the process from the previous side. I found a smooth spot without the burr. I'm going to try five more passes, as it is a very small spot. All right, this side is even. Flip the knife. Do three passes. Flip the knife. Do three more passes. Flip the knife and do one pass. Flip and one. Flip and one. Flip and one. At this point, your objective is to weaken the burr. Now flip and do a stropping pass. Use very little pressure. Flip and strop the other side. The stropping strokes further weaken the burr. Now flip the knife back to the starting position and grab your pencil. As a newbie, you will have trouble removing the burr. I began using a pencil for this. Take the pencil and slowly run it down the blade, slightly turning it as you go, and use very little pressure. This will remove what is left of the burr. As you gain experience, you will be able to remove the burr without using a pencil. The first stone is the most important, not the last. If you do not get your bevel even, or you have deep spots, this will only compound as you progress. With each stone used, your ability to cut the edge and correct any uneven spots becomes smaller and smaller. After 600 grit, it becomes impossible. As long as you take your time with the most coarse stone, you will be fine. 
If you do not plan on doing a great deal of reformatting, what I am doing to this knife, you will not need an 80 grit stone. I sharpen a lot of pocket knives, in most cases reformatting the blades from 30 degrees to 22.5. I actually get some use out of this 80 grit stone. Now it's time for the 150 grit stone. From what I've witnessed on YouTube, most guys use the sharpening stones to set their angle. For the sake of explanation, I will show you how this is done. First you remove the stone you have just finished using from the clamping block. Now you hold that stone even with the underside of the clamping block. Slide your doodad, this one comes in the box with the hap stone, up firmly beneath the stone and tighten it in place. Now grab the next stone, in our case the 150. From this point on, never loosen the doodad. Instead you'll adjust the clamping block. This compensates for the differences in stone thicknesses while keeping the same angle you began with, in our case 17 and a half. Whether you decide to use this method, or the method I'm about to show you, never, under any circumstances, use this thing. I also began sharpening using the stones to set the angle. However, I soon realized this method is prone to user error. For example, if your finger slips, if you apply too much pressure, if the stone isn't level, perhaps the stone turns or twists a little, or if you're simply not holding your mouth right, your angle will end up being slightly off. A few tenths of a degree may not sound like much. It is. For example, if you end up three or four tenths shallow, now you must grind the bevel that much longer to make your burr. At this point, the bevel angle has changed. As a consequence, you are now using up expensive sharpening stones, not to mention working harder and wasting time. If you end up a few tenths of a degree too steep, now you have made a line in your bevel. Above said line, the knife blade is left untouched by the current stone, thus making a mirror polish impossible. Believe me, this will eventually happen, and then it will happen some more. My solution for this is to use a quality angle cube to check the angle after each stone and adjust if needed. Substandard angle cubes have a 3-4 to four second delay before displaying your angle each time you slightly move one of them. If you are using a substandard angle cube, the method I just showed you is your best option. Just look how easy it is to simply set the angle between each stone with a quality angle cube. So much faster. I find it helpful to squirt down all of the stones each time I change one. Before you use your next stone, take a moment to look at the scratch pattern from the previous one. Now make three cutting strokes. Has a line appeared in the bevel? Has the appearance of the scratch pattern changed? Even though you just set the angle, it is important to check this. As a beginner, you may not have placed the stone in the clamping block properly, or placed the angle cube askew. Checking this with each stone is good practice, and it will save you a lot of wasted time if you catch a small mistake now. If the stone is rubbing the bevel evenly, you will see the scratch pattern has changed considerably. Now use 17 more cutting strokes. Again, there is no predetermined number of cutting strokes. I am using 20 total at this point based solely on how the blade reacted to the first stone. As you gain experience, you too will know how many to use. Every knife is different. This one is harder than I'd guessed it would be. Hey, maybe that's the magic of titanium bonding. All right, let's check the burr, making sure it's complete along the entire edge of the knife. I'm sure you've figured this out by now, but just to reiterate, the grit rating is inversely proportional 
to the cutting power of each sharpening stone. As you progress through the stones, each one will make a smaller scratch pattern and a smaller burr. With coarse stones, it is not difficult to determine if the burr is complete from tip to end. There is no reason to purposely make a huge burr. As soon as you can fill it, that is enough. The larger you make the burr is directly proportional to the amount of blade material you have just wasted. In fact, as a beginner, you should practice on your mother-in-law's kitchen knives. Once you get the hang of burr making, then try sharpening your own kitchen knives. And again, if you find the burr is not complete from one end of the knife to the other end, you need to do more complete cutting strokes. You will be tempted to rub the stone back and forth like a file over the problem spots. Don't do it. If you do, your knife will end up with dull spots, and you can forget about slicing paper with that shoddy edge you just made. Continue with complete cutting strokes only until the burr is from tip to edge, no matter how many cutting strokes it takes. Only the very first stone can be used like a file. The burr is complete, so now we flip the knife and repeat the process on the opposite side. Both sides are now complete. Now flip the knife and make three cutting strokes. There is no need to fill for the burr. The following steps are to weaken it. Now flip and do three passes. Flip and one. Flip and one. Flip and one. Flip and one. Flip and do a light stropping stroke. Flip and strop. Now flip the knife back to your starting position and use the pencil. Time for the 240 stone. Remember to start with three cutting strokes and check to make sure there is no line forming in the bevel. Hopefully you can see this. There is a line near the hilt, although it disappears as it nears the curve. As the line doesn't run the length of the blade, and it is nearly at the outer edge of the bevel, it will most likely disappear after 20 cutting strokes. Again, because the line doesn't run the entire length of the blade and it is so close to the edge, we do not need to check the angle or stone again. If the line were in the center of the bevel, or near the inner edge, we would have to stop and see what is causing the problem. Nine times out of ten, the line is caused by not setting the angle correctly. After we finished filming, I purposely made a line and a bevel so I could explain to you in more detail. I do not have the proper lens to capture this. Hopefully you can see it. This line is what to watch for. If this happens, and you fail to catch it immediately, you will most likely have to start over. And nobody wants that. I am looking at the bevel after each cutting stroke, and the line is steadily disappearing. That means the angle was just a tiny, tiny bit too shallow, probably one tenth of a degree. Time to check the burr. The line is completely gone, and we have a complete burr. So, three strokes on the opposite side. Inspect the bevel. No line on this side. Perfect. 17 more strokes. There's still a fairly large burr with this grit. Flip and three. No need to fill for the burr. Flip and three. Flip and one. Flip and one. Flip and one. Flip and one. Flip and a stropping stroke. Flip in a strop. Time for the pencil. I have only recently began using a 400 grit stone. The major benefit from this grit is its capability to erase the deep gashes left by the previous coarse stones. It greatly improves the finish on your mirror polish. The burr is getting smaller.
Now it's time to move up to the medium stones. For everyday carry knives and kitchen knives, these will be your finishing stones. Six to eight hundred are good for pocket knives and paring knives. Chef's knives do well with one to two thousand grit finish. Although considered a medium grit stone by most knife sharpeners, the 600 is nonetheless capable of cutting, as well as making a noticeable burr. See what I did there? I passed the blade tip. It felt bad, because it is bad. Try avoiding this. If you are finishing using a 600 grit stone, the scratch pattern will be pretty noticeable. The strop will polish it up and give it a nice glint in the light. You will not be able to see your reflection, but it will nonetheless shine. Alright, let's move along to the 800. After 20 cutting strokes, the burr was not complete. From the curve to the blade tip, I felt the burr. From the curve back to the hilt, I was not able to feel it. I used several more complete cutting strokes until I could feel the burr. Let's flip it and do 20 cutting strokes on the opposite side. If you are going to finish with a 1000, 1200, or even a 2000 grit stone, you can skip the 800. Using the 800 will not make a medium grit finish any sharper in my opinion, although it is important for a mirror finish. I don't know if you caught it, but I passed the knife tip again. This still presents a challenge to me. Hopefully you will not be such a slow learner. Alright, the burr is faint in the same place it was completely missing on the other side, but I can feel it. The burr does not need to be even in size. It doesn't matter if it is super noticeable at one place on the blade, and so small you can barely feel it on another. The burr just needs to be. If you can feel it along the entire edge of the blade, large or barely there, you are ready to move on. Time to flip the blade and begin the process of removing the burr. Not everyone removes the burr between each stone. I would assume most guys do not. Some folks believe removing it between each stone will achieve an even sharper edge. I don't know if that's true. What I do know is that by sharpening this way, as a beginner, you will gain a lot more experience with removing your burr. Time for the 1000 grit. Did I mention how much I like these Choceras? At this point, it will become more difficult for you to fill the burr. I'm going to make additional cutting strokes. I'll do 30 on each side. This has the added benefit of improving the mirror polish we are attempting to achieve here. Alright, after 30 passes with the stone, I can definitely fill the burr. It's small, but it's there. If your hands are not as callous as mine, you may be able to fill the burr with your fingertips instead of using your fingernails. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with having fancy lad fingers, guys. It's time for Jinday's 15 Micron Wonder. These resin bonded diamond stones work great and hold up to punishment. Only after using this thing for over six months am I now able to appreciate just how good it is. The micron measurement thing is annoying. I assume, although I don't know for sure, that these things are made by mixing bulk diamond powder, packaged by size, in this case 15 micron particles, with a bonding agent. To help put the micron scale into perspective, the average grain of table salt, like the ones in restaurant packets, measures 100 microns. The average grain of talcum powder measures 10 microns. Anyway, I ended up making a reference sheet for myself to convert micron into grit. Be advised, sharpening stones vary greatly. One brand's 600 grit is another's 1200. That's pretty bad. Add to that, you must deal with at least four separate scales of coarseness when shopping for stones. 
grit and microns, as previously mentioned. The Soviets have yet another scale, and Japan has their own unit of measurement. All right, let's check out our 15 micron finish. Again, these pictures are difficult to focus. Now for the final Chosera, which is also our final medium stone. A 2000 stone will be the last one which is capable of making a noticeable burr. At this point, you can get an idea of how well you have done based on how uniform as well as how easily the burr forms. With certain stills, the bubble will have a little shine at this point. The scratch pattern should be light, and more importantly for the mirror finish, it should be uniform. As we are going for a mirror polish, it will not hurt to use some extra cutting strokes here. This will be the last stone with at least some cutting power. Use this to erase as many gashes and scratches from the bevel as possible. Hell, let's give this titanium bonded gem 40 passes on each side. Hopefully it is becoming clearer to you how to count your strokes. Again, there is no set pattern. Counting simply helps you gauge how your knife is conforming to the stones. Each knife you sharpen will be different. For example, if this blade were Elmax, I would be using many more cutting strokes. Sometimes you will sharpen a cheap knife and be surprised at how strong the metal is. With each knife you sharpen, you will know if it is good or if it is crap after you have finished with the very first stone. Here we are, the polishing stones. The most expensive and least used stones a man can own. Hindu sandstone, and you would never guess this from the name, comes from a quarry in Orange County, Indiana. Is this a real Hindu stone? And not likely. It was pretty expensive nonetheless. A common tactic used by companies who sell sharpening supplies is to use names of well-known stone types. These businesses will also label their products using the name of geographic regions where the well-known stones originate. In many, if not most cases, what you are buying is not what the name implies. Their product is simply a small 6 by 1 inch sliver cut from a block of some composite material these guys had made in a warehouse. Speaking of composite material, my next purchase may well be a 6 micron Jinde resin bonded stone to replace this thing. When I started out, I wanted all natural stones for polishing. After gaining some experience, however, nothing yet has beat these resin bonded diamond stones. As the burr becomes increasingly harder to feel, it is even more important to watch the scratch pattern. With some steels, the burr will be noticeable. On others, it will be all but impossible to feel. As mentioned before, using more cutting strokes with finer stones will result in a more polished finish. With polishing stones, after making a burr on each side, try using 10 cutting strokes. Now 5. Now 2. Finish with the onesies on each side then a stropping pass, and continue using the pencil. Now for the 3 micron. If you were to use a fast back and forth filing motion with this thing, and again, never do that, but if you did, this particular stone is capable of making a sizable burr. That's pretty awesome for a roughly 7,000 grit stone. The more time you spend with finishing stones, the better your finish will look. I'm going to begin with 30 cutting strokes. Now 10, 5, 2, some onesies and the pencil. Five. 
final stone. Let's go crazy with this one micron. 40 strokes on each side. Now 20. Ten on each side. Five. Two strokes on each side. Three onesies. And then the pencil. With your final stone, after using the pencil, you want to use some more onesies. Let's do five. You can do as many onesies as you have patience for. I do not have the patience for this crap knife. It's a lot of effort for an edge that isn't going to last. You do not have to strop your knife. You could just start slicing paper at this point. Even though this knife is not worthy of it, I'll use this nano strop so you can see how it works. But first, dry your edge off thoroughly. The sales pitch for nano cloths is that you can achieve an exact level of abrasive, as the strop material has zero abrasive qualities. Only the diamond emulsion compound, sold separately of course. The nanocloth consists of what feels like, and looks like, a silicone mesh. This is the diamond emulsion compound. Various grit levels can be purchased. And I have to admit it, I like using the nano thingies. The diamond emulsion can also be spread on leather strops. If you do go with a leather strop, purchase a thin one. The thick ones are less effective as they tend to fold over the edge of your bevel. Set your strop to the same degree as the rest of your stones. Never use cutting strokes with a strop, this nano thing or leather. If you forget, your strop will be damaged beyond repair, in some cases immediately, so don't forget. As a beginner, you will be tempted to apply pressure as you strop. Don't do it. This will damage the strop as well. More importantly, applying pressure will cause the strop to fold over your bevel and screw up that nice edge you just made. I am still experimenting with how many passes to use with this nano cloth. I'll begin with 10 strokes on each side. Be careful with your strop when you come to the point. It doesn't take much to ruin one here. Now five. Now two. And some onesies. Take your time when removing your knife. If you slip when using the Allen wrench, this mishap all but guarantees some stitches. If you were to really nail it, a finger or two might not function as before. Do not underestimate how sharp guided systems can make blades. If you have kids in your house, it may not be the best idea to have a surgical edge on your steak knives. At this point, I'm going to provide a short summary on the steps to sharpen your knife. Make sure the angle is the same on both sides. If it isn't, you will struggle every time you switch stones and eventually have to start over. If you do not make a burr along the entire knife blade, you will be struggling with your cutting strokes from here on out. Getting a complete burr is essential for the entire process. If you have successfully made a complete burr with your first stone, Achieving a burr with the rest of your stones will be simple and relatively fast. If you do not completely remove the burr, your knife will not cut very well, and stropping will be an effort in futility. On the last stone, experiment with the amount of onesies you finish with. As you do your onesies, gradually apply less and less pressure until only the weight of the stone is being used. And again, when stropping, do not use pressure. 
and now it's time for paper slicing. And it slices. Let's try a tomato. Pretty thin. Still not that exciting. I recently saw Jared from Neve's Knives perform this trick. I have honestly never attempted this with any knife. And it feels kind of wrong trying it with such a piece of crap. But at least it's for educational purposes. Alright, here goes. I'll be damned. I have to say, that is fun. Let's try it again. Holy crap. The edge is already dulling. It will still cut paper, but not like before. Let's put a usable edge on this titanium bonded wonder. This paracord costs the same as the knife. Well worth the cost, as the paracord handle will now allow me to LARP as an urban survivalist. I don't know about you guys, but I was pretty surprised this thing did not come with a rat tail tang. That being accomplished, I'll go with a 2000 grit finish. Now let's see what a medium grit finish can do. It still slices. It still slices just as thin. Alright, let's try a grape. Probably not the safest way to do this. Now that's thin. Let's try some more. Holy crap. More paper slicing. That's a sliver of heat shrink on the handle, by the way. Time for urban survivalist training. I could not take this thing away from my wife after she got it to stick for the first time. Throwing knives is pretty fun. I sincerely hope this video gave you enough information to achieve a paper slicing edge. It's not perfect, and I'm sure you will still have questions. Ask in the comments. No two people sharpen a knife the same way. In another six months, I will do some things differently. Watch some more videos. Take from them things you like. Use this to make your own technique.